Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Mauritius compliance stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, Ex-wife told me to remove all my stuff from her storage unit. So I did. My ex-wife and I split because she cheated. So our separation was quite tumultuous. She still hasn't apologized for the act of cheating and still denies it even though I know beyond any reasonable doubt that she did. I was incredibly hurt at the time and I'll admit I wasn't acting my best. But I still tried to treat her fairly. When she left we agreed that she would take over the payment on our car because she needed it for work. Our other car was totally paid off and I couldn't afford the payment on the one that she drove. But I agreed to leave my name on the loan because her credit didn't qualify, to be honest I didn't really have an alternative. I told her that she could keep it for as long as she made the payments. And that she paid it off I would immediately sign her over the title. But if she started flaking on the payments I would have the car voluntarily repossessed. I also agreed to give her the washer and dryer on the condition that she takes over the car payments. I had purchased the washer and dryer but had no use for them because I lived in an apartment at the time this is important for later. Well, we inevitably got into a disagreement over the parenting of our children, I can't remember exactly what it was about to be honest. And she randomly showed up with the car handed me the keys, and said, have fun figuring out how to make the payments, she knew I couldn't afford them. And then ended with a, and get all your crap out of my storage unit, we hadn't finished untangling the mess of items in our jointly owned storage unit, but she wanted it done immediately because she was mad. So I did what she asked. I went over that day to get my crap out of our storage unit. While I was in there I saw the washer and dryer sitting in the corner and immediately remembered that I had only given them to her on the condition that she pay off the car. So I took them. I had absolutely zero needs for them at the time. But she had very specifically wanted my crap out of her storage unit. So who was I to argue? She called me a day later screaming about it telling me that she had filed a police report. I just laughed knowing they wouldn't do anything because it was my property. The story gets better, as it turns out she was just angry and actually wanted the car back. Well the day after she had dropped it off on me I got into a freak accident and totaled it, everyone was okay. So she ended up without a car and I never had to make a single payment on it. The universe wanted to maliciously comply with her demands. The next one is titled, he wanted all his stuff back, so I made sure he for everything. So my last relationship was beyond bad, he was all sorts of abusive and controlling. At one point I had the strength to break up with him but then we got back together after we discussed some things. Stupid I know, but yeah love and all that. Well anyways one of the things we agreed on was that he and I would stop drinking alcohol because he was beyond crazy aggressive when he drank and I wanted to support his sobriety. This is really important. Fast forward about 8 months or so and we got into a huge fight and I not only broke up with him, I kicked him out of the house and told him he wasn't ever allowed back inside. We'd been living together over a year at this point so his mum got in touch with me about getting his stuff. While on the phone with her I could hear him in the background saying, make sure they get everything I own or bought. I want it all back. Apparently even stuff he gifted me he wanted back, but honestly I didn't care, I was happy to get rid of anything related to him. While cleaning our room up and gathering everything I started to come across numerous bottles and cans of alcohol. It seems he had been drinking again for a while and was hiding the evidence in the room. I mean he was hiding them under the bed, in his guitar case, rolled up in his clothes, in some old backpacks of mine and so on and so forth. He had said he wanted everything of his, so any bottle and the few unopened cans I found went straight into one of the garbage bags of his stuff. By the time I had gathered everything up, I had three bags of stuff and one was basically all just the alcohol. Dropping them off was just so satisfying. He actually called moments after I left his parents place ranting about how petty and immature I was being. My response? Well you wanted all of your stuff back, and those definitely weren't mine. Plus I figured you'd probably need a drink to deal with the breakup. I promptly ended the call and blocked him on everything. Most satisfying thing I've ever done. 
Edit, this happened years ago, but knowing people are still proud of me for leaving means the world to me. Also there's definitely a lot about this story that didn't get posted, such as cops having to be involved and other things. I didn't put open cans or unscrew and bottle lids just for the fact I didn't want to risk ruining his stuff as that'd be a huge headache and everything. The next one is titled, Military Leave Malicious Compliance. Some background, in the military, you earn 30 days of paid leave per year. The maximum you can carry over between fiscal years is 60 days. This creates a situation where a service member may have to use their leave just to avoid losing it. It's extremely easy to have a large leave balance due to deployments and other obligations that prevent you from actually using it. I needed to burn 12 days of leave in order to be at 60 days for the start of the fiscal year. Lacking funds to actually go anywhere, my plan was to simply take a week off in the present month, a week off in the next month, and two days off at another random time just before the fiscal year ends. At my previous duty station, it would have been permitted to take Monday to Friday and only use five days of leave so long as you weren't leaving the area and were still available on the weekend. Well, admin rejected my leave request because by regulation, leave was supposed to start at the end of your last shift and end just before your next shift. Basically, they wanted me to start leave at 16.01 Friday through 6.59 on the next Monday for a total of 9 days used. And no, the fact that weekends were non-duty days did not matter. Rather than using 9 days of leave to take 5 days off, I started my leave at 16.01 Monday and ended it at 6.59 Friday for a total of 3 days of leave used. I continued working only on Mondays and Fridays for the next month. Edit, for those speculating on the branch, this was in the Navy. I'm a civilian now and while I get half the PTO I did in the Navy, it goes just as far since I don't have to waste it on non-work days. The next one is titled, High on the Hogs. My brother once built half a house on some land my dad sold him. Due to financial hardship, the brother needed to use the equity in that home to get a second loan and finish building. Time goes on and he begins to do really well, so he sells the first house he built at a profit and buys some land, like, 175 acres in the Midwest, he lives in a rural area. He likes to hunt and does some farming on the land but the house that was there when he bought it isn't ideal, despite some major improvements and renovation. So he builds a third house and puts the house up for sale. He keeps the land around the house for hunting, this is important later. This is when one of our envious family members asks if he and his wife would consider selling them the house. They can only qualify for something like half of what it's worth, but my brother is a fairly generous guy. He agrees to sell the house to them at a rather hefty discount since their family. A few short months go by. He's driving by the property and spots a for sale sign. He stops in and the husband explains that there were some things about the house they weren't happy with, so they were planning on selling it and buying a house more in town or something, etc. My brother explains that they got a sweet deal only because they were family and that he'd appreciate them selling the house back to him for what he sold it to them for. The husband basically closes the door on that, and my brother leaves. And he thinks about it. I'm 100% certain that the family members understood that they were getting a good deal because they were family and he was happier selling it to them with the understanding that they weren't to take advantage of his good graces. The next day he drives out with some fence in the back of his truck, and the family members in the house wake up to some fence posts being driven into the ground. The husband comes out. What's going on, he asks. Backquote I'm just putting up some hog fence on my property. Don't worry, it's all on my land. I'll just go around your house here and put a gate in so you can get in and out. The husband is a bit perplexed. You're bringing in pigs? And my brother was seriously set to do it too. He had about 100 lined up from a farmer down the road. The husband goes back into the house. A few minutes of discussion occurred. The next day they all meet at the bank and the deed is transferred back to my brother. And he didn't even have to deploy the hogs. The next one is titled, Property Line Jailbird. I dealt with a hostile neighbor over property line concerns. An 83-year-old neighbor threatened to tear down his own fence to kill my dogs. Then over time he threatened to kill me. I put up a new fence parallel to his old one. 
He tore down his fence and then demanded that I move my new one because it was on his property. Even cut off pieces to throw at my dogs, put up threatening signs, cut all the branches off his trees and threw them in my yard, etc. I didn't move the fence. Finally, I got a four-year protective order against the hostile individual. In court he tried to bribe the bailiff to make the case go away. The judge called him out on it. Two weeks later after the PO was finalized he got in my face and threatened to shoot me in front of my pregnant wife. Cops came and didn't do anything because they didn't want to arrest an 83-year-old. A year after he threatened to kill me in front of my pregnant wife, I get a call from the county DA asking if I still want to press charges. Yep. For the past month he's been in and out of jail and court from the past year of his bullshit against me. I hope he enjoys those legal fees on his social security income. The next one is titled, Half a Yard Lost. Before complaining, it's important to do your research, as one nasty neighbor found out. When a new neighbor bought the house next to my family's home, the neighbor started doing renovations without permits. Then the neighbor had the audacity to complain that the fence my family had built needed to be dug up and removed. My parents tried to reason with him, explaining that all the land lines in the area are all crooked, and that everything had been this way for 30 plus years without issue. He wouldn't hear of it and insisted on the removal, so my mum called the city and requested a new aval after fighting with this guy for months. Turns out, not only was the fence on our land, but his new one, fence, was on ours as well. His back fence was on the land of the backyard neighbor and same on the other side. My mum got the three other houses that boarded his to all get avals as well, so in the end he lost almost half his yard to the surrounding houses. The next one is titled, How I Almost Ruined, The, Christmas, Concert. I was a senior in high school when this happened. We had a music teacher who hated me for some reason. I'm not sure why because I never acted up in class and was in both band and chorus voluntarily. My flute playing skills are okay, but I have a pretty great singing voice. Not a, next winner of AGT, singing voice, but pretty good. I've been singing pretty much since I could talk, I have good breath support, project well, and have a decent range. One day before chorus practice the music teacher comes to me and says, I need you to blend with everyone. I don't want to hear your voice over anyone else's. My face turned about 18 shades of red but I managed to say through clenched teeth, okay, sure, no problem. So we start practice. She starts playing the piano, there's the cue, and I open my mouth to sing as per usual, only almost nothing comes out. Mind you, I am singing. Just so quietly that only the person sitting next to me can hear me. It was a disaster. Half the room missed the cue to start singing. Several people are staring at me. You can hear the alto section better than the soprano section, my section, so there's no strong melody. The tenors and bass might as well not even be in the room. She stops playing about halfway through when it becomes apparent that nobody knows the song or their cues without me singing at my normal volume. She's glaring at me and I'm staring straight back at her like, what? She starts again. Periodically she's looking up from the piano at me, but like I said, I was singing, so she never caught me just sitting there not moving my mouth like she clearly wanted to. Practice proceeded in this fashion for a painful hour. It was the same for every song that we tried, missed cues, barely audible singing all around, and the music teacher's face getting redder and redder. At the end of that class she came to me again, and asked me why I wasn't singing. I told her that I was singing, but she wanted me to blend in so I couldn't sing very loud or she'd be able to hear me above other people. And that it wasn't my fault that she couldn't hear anyone else. She angrily turned to the person I shared music with, but she backed me up and said that she could hear me singing. Nothing she could do. This went on for weeks. She tried everything to improve the performance of everyone else. She had us move our chairs closer. She mixed alto and soprano. She had us all stand in a big circle in the gym facing her and each other. She pounded on the piano keys harder. Nothing helped. Other chorus members asked me what was going on. I just told them that our teacher told me to blend. Finally, two weeks before the Christmas concert, so really only four or five practices left, the music teacher came to me and very quietly said, I'm going to need you to sing at your normal volume. 
Okay, sure, no problem. There was an audible, oh thank god, from someone in the alto section that day when I started singing. None of the other people in chorus were bad singers, but I guess they had learned to rely on my timing and volume to give them the confidence to perform, because the improvement was dramatic once I was allowed to sing again. The next one is titled, We'll Just Switch to the Hot Site. I once worked in the IT department for a company that managed some utilities and infrastructure. They had multiple facilities throughout their state, and some extensive redundancy measures in place to keep the buildings connected in case of an emergency. One of the most important of these measures was their hot site, a backup facility that housed a replica of their computer network infrastructure. The hot site was located in a separate building from the main data center, so even if the main building was knocked offline, the hot site would still be available to take over operations. Of course, simply having the equipment and policies to recover from an emergency aren't enough, so the company also had an emergency preparedness committee with representatives from several key departments. The committee held regular simulated emergency drills wherein a member would write and direct an emergency scenario, and the others would rehearse the process of recovering from it. The IT department's contributions to these activities were frequently marginalized by the rest of the committee, who firmly believed that the only appropriate way to handle any computer problem was just to activate the hot site. After all, it is a complete, functional replica of our main systems. Why bother doing anything else when the problem can be instantly solved by simply plugging in a different computer? Well, the thing is that switching to our hot site was easier said than done. Think of it like the spare tire in your car. It's there if you need it, but it doesn't automatically replace a flat tire, you need to spend some time and effort to take the old one off and put the new one on. And once you finish your road trip, you generally want to get the tire properly replaced rather than continuing to use the spare. And if you're having engine problems, you don't solve it by putting on a different tires. And so on. The point is that a hot site doesn't solve every problem, and even if it does, switching to ours in particular would take some time. The IT representatives explained that every time, but were always ignored. Finally, one of the network engineers was selected to lead one of the emergency drills, and this guy was fed up with everybody else always suggesting the hot site as a solution. Once the committee had taken their seats to hear what crisis they would be averting that day, the network engineer informed them that the building they currently occupied had just been demolished by a storm, and none of the computer systems there remained. Time to activate the hot site. He grabbed his stuff from the table and left the building. And at that moment, all of the other departments realized that they had no clue how to even get to the hot site. The other IT representatives, being directly responsible for the upkeep of the facility, knew where to go, and were out the door only moments after the network engineer. Everybody else was considerably less prepared to relocate to a different building. If they had looked out the window as the IT people left, they might have seen which direction they had turned out of the parking lot, but nothing more, after all, the hot site is designed to be isolated from anything that would damage the main facility, so it is located a fair distance away. The last of the emergency preparedness committee arrived several hours after the IT department had all arrived on site. Not wanting to admit that they had no clue where they were going, they had no better option than to drive from one maintenance building to the next across the state, hoping that their next destination happened to house the backup facility. By this point, the drill had taken much longer than the schedule had originally allowed, and the network engineer called it off, noting that the site would probably be just about ready to be brought online if they had actually bothered to start setting it up. They didn't, of course, since that would have disrupted the entire network. The IT department wasn't allowed to direct another drill for quite some time after that, but at least everybody else was much more reluctant to suggest the hot site as a catch-all solution. The last one is titled, A Computer Half Broken. It is part of my job to process orders and for the purposes of this story I process two categories, the few orders entered under the old legacy system and all the other types of orders entered the new POS system. And no, POS does not mean point of sale in this case. The orders came to my group in an electronic queue with labels indicating what type they are. Unfortunately, some of my team members used those labels to cherry-pick the easy orders and left the difficult ones for people like yours truly. Corporate in infinite wisdom decided the best way to address this situation was to remove all the labels, making cherry-picking impossible. 
I, being more intelligent than a demented lemur, immediately adjusted my computer to put the labels back in again. It didn't matter as far as I was concerned because I'd been acting in good faith in the first place. It was just typical corporate one size fits no one bullshit. Today my computer broke, well, half broke. The shiny new POS system, with its bright colors, clean lines, and user friendliness crapped out, leaving me only able to use the old, ugly, spaghetti coded, and infinitely more stable legacy system. So, I can't work on the vast majority orders at this point. Cherry picking the orders I can work on would be mighty useful, but also against the rules, and I'm not about to about to admit to management that I can bypass their stupid label removal. So, instead I sat on my butt for an hour and a half browsing R, malicious compliance while waiting for IT to get their act in gear. Thanks for listening.